I think uh, uh, to pursue an international law career, a law student needs to be have the fundamentals down. I think every every subject matter at law school is valid to a certain extent, even if you're not using it. Um, so I would say um, study uh, the, the, the basics. And I, I look at it too as the law school didn't really teach me about law. Um, I, I often remember when I, I finished law school and I started working as a lawyer, um, law school didn't teach me how to handle clients. Law school didn't really teach me how to handle conflicts. Um, the, the, the learning process is, is long and uh, it starts in law school but it doesn't, certainly doesn't end there. I don't know. I mean, that's a very tough question. Um, visiting people in jail, that's not easy, because I get to go home. Um, dealing with refugees, dealing with people who uh, have lost everything. I sat down in a tent with a man in uh, Macedonia who was uh, originally from Pristina, and he had five daughters. Um, one was missing, so he had four, and his wife, and uh, his English was pretty good, and he told me that uh, 48 hours earlier, when he was sitting in Pristina, he had a taxi company, a restaurant, and a construction company. Now, he had clothes on his back, uh, he, didn't have, he didn't have shoes, the, sh the shoes he had were given to him, and he was living in a tent. So. Uh, and I was feeling guilty about the fact that I was going to leave the refugee camp, go home to this little apartment I was renting in Skopje, take a hot bath and have a meal and have a drink. So um, I think the hardest part is uh, seeing people that, that have a lot of suffering. Um, and it's, it's probably even harder when you you think about the fact that it's not really going to change much. Um, fortunately, the man in the tent in, uh, in Skopje went back to Pristina. I'm sure he rebuilt his business, but um, thinking back to my time in Bangladesh, millions and millions and millions of Bangladeshis that uh, give poverty a whole new name. We're, we're talking about uh, children that live on the street, um, absolutely filthy. Uh, no food, living in rags, and then if you, you know, it, it, it takes a strong stomach, but then you talk about the, uh, the sexual abuse uh, the, with young children, uh, women are uh, bought and sold, um, the violence against women and children, it's, uh, it's not easy, not, not at all. So I think, um, uh, you know, the most difficult thing I think back to, uh, I, I remember in my first job with UNRWA in Jerusalem, I met an old Palestinian man who had a key around his neck from his house in um, north of Tel Aviv. And uh, he asked me to take the key and go back, that key was to his house, and he asked me to go back and uh, see if, check on his house, that's what he wanted, but he gave me the key. And I went back, the house wasn't there anymore. Um, so, you deal with people who have life situations that are tragic and it, it makes you feel guilty because you have uh, so much compared to them. Sure. Sure. It's very, um, very proper things to witness. Um, maybe on a later note, uh, what was your favorite project? Out of all the things, things, projects you worked with? And 
Uh, my favorite experience. Um, I, I, that's that's tough, but um, I, I'm going back recently to my experience in Afghanistan. I, I really uh, enjoyed being with the Afghan men, uh, and, and because of the culture, being with Afghan women is not possible. So um, one day the Afghan men came to me, some some colleagues, and they asked me if I would go for a picnic with them. And for security reasons, I was not supposed to. But I snuck out of the guest house. They picked me up surreptitiously in the car. Uh, we drove up through the mountains. They put out a couple of carpets by the stream. They started grilling some lamb. We had green tea. Uh, we had flat bread. And we just sat there in the grass by the stream and ate and enjoyed each other's company. And I think that's sort of quintessential uh, Afghan afternoon in terms of having a good time. Uh, and if you compare it with uh, what we have in the West, uh, in, in America, um, that, you know, that just doesn't quite fill the bill. We've, we, we have a lot of stuff, and we cram a lot of stuff in. And I think the simplicity really appealed to me, plus the, the camaraderie. They're very warm people, and um, just being with them and talking and laughing and eating was, was fantastic. These are also things that I think are... Uh, Timeless, because if you think many times when I was in Afghanistan, I was looking around and I thought the scene I'm looking at could be from, two th including especially the prison in Jalalabad. This could be 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. I see nothing here that looks like uh, 2,000 whatever. Um, so it's uh, it was a great experience in terms of of seeing how other people live. And uh, I know how Afghanistan and the Afghans have been portrayed in the media in the West, and I think that's been skewed a lot. I think that uh, what's missing is the fact that uh, Afghans are incredibly intelligent people, even though 80% are illiterate. Um, they're some of the brightest people I've ever met, hardworking, and uh, the um, certain issues about gender violence, for instance, I've, I've given talks to groups before and often this has come up about the uh, violence against women and I, I posited the question, I said, it seems to me that you're asking, do Afghan men love their wives and daughters? The answer is absolutely. Um, I don't know where this idea came from, although I suspect it's the media, that every Afghan man is, uh, is beats his wife, wives, and children, but that's absolutely not true. Um, there are people, in fact, in many ways, I found Afghans to be more um, family-oriented than we are in the West. Wonderful. It was a great experience. Um, do you, I know you said you were taking a break for a little while. Right. Um, and someone sort of asked about your next move. Um, so kind of on that topic, you've, you've lived many places, traveled all over the world. Is there any place that you haven't been that you would love to go? Mm. Um, to work, you mean? Yes. Um, I'd like to go to South America, somewhere in South America. I've, it's a continent I don't know. I've been down to Central America. That was, in fact, that was right after I graduated from law school. Um, it's, it's, I've been to Africa, but not seen that much of it, Asia, but the one part of the world that I haven't, uh, that I don't know, never even, I've never been there, is South America. It could be Brazil, but um, I'm also fascinated with Patagonia because of the wildness. So I um, don't know what kind of work I'd get in Patagonia, but you never know. Um, after all of your experiences and all of the, the jobs that you've had, I guess maybe what's what's the one if you had to give one takeaway to someone looking to for a similar career, what would you what would you say to that? Um, the takeaway, I think it, it would be that 
the most important thing in life is that um, if you have to work, and look, there's some people that don't have to work, and uh, I was not one of those, but if you don't have to work, you can just enjoy life. If you have to work, it's important that you enjoy your work. I have told our children that, that don't let society or your teachers or other, your, your friends try to tell you that, ah, oh, well, you should do such and such. And if you don't do this, then you're not successful. Uh, you have to live your own life. It goes without saying. But as long as you're comfortable with what you're doing, it, as long as you like your work, um, your salary and other issues, that'll fall into place. Um, I feel very sorry for people that studied something that they didn't like. When I was in college, for instance, it was accounting. Everybody wanted to study accounting and become a CPA because you were guaranteed back then $38,000 a year. So we were talking about 30 some years ago. And I didn't know any person, nobody. None of my friends that studied accounting wanted to be. They liked that work. Um, and I was studying history. And they looked at me and thought that I was crazy. And I used to wonder whether I was doing the right thing. But I never really worried about it because I was satisfied with the fact that I liked it. I liked my history books. I liked to read. So the fact that my future was so uncertain and I could have been poor, or relatively poor, I never really thought about it that much. I, I think I just, maybe because I was naive, but I just assumed everything would sort of fall into place. And if it doesn't fall into place, well, so what? I mean, that happens. Okay. Well, I don't, um, don't take up any more time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.